Okay, so we are going to dive into chocolate here in Science of Baking. We have already talked about chocolate quite a bit in the International Pastries class and learned how to do the basic tempering process and how to make things out of chocolate. But now it's time to learn a little bit more about what's going on inside the chocolate and where the chocolate comes from and how it is produced. So these are the words and concepts that are in the chapter in the textbook. And you will see a lot of these are very familiar terms that we've already talked about quite a bit in the International Pages class. So I won't bother you with some of them, but you will see that um, there are three words here that we use for chocolate, uh, the types of cocoa beans that are out there. And you'll see the word Forestero, Criollo, and Trinitario. And these are the three different grades of beans that are used for blending to make most chocolate that we know of today. Now, there are different parts of chocolate. Uh, chocolate is made up of cocoa butter. It's also made up of cocoa solids. And it's usually then made of, of sugar as well. Um, you can buy an unsweetened chocolate, like a uh, baker's, what they call baker's chocolate. But um, most, most edible chocolate today is, uh, is sweetened. Um, there are cocoa products, chocolate products, um, these are different things made with chocolate, and we will we'll talk about a little bit more about those and try to differentiate what they are. Um, we'll talk a little bit about the process of making chocolate. You'll see the words conching. Um, conching is part of the process. There's also another uh, series of processes that go through that chocolate goes through in the factory. Chocolate is very hard to make by the way it is. It's very hard to make by yourself. It's really best just to buy it already made, uh, but there are people out there who are getting raw beans. They are fermenting them, they are roasting them, and they are making chocolate from bean to bar, as they call it. So let's move on here. We'll talk a little bit more about some of the details of chocolate. This is a photograph of cocoa beans, and you'll see that when you break open a cocoa cacao pod, that there are these cocoa beans inside. Now the cocoa beans are wrapped inside of these white um, it's sort of a white little envelope and uh, inside each envelope is a cocoa bean. Um, these are usually hollowed out first in the jungle and then they are placed on banana leaves. They're put in a pile and, can, and covered with banana leaves and allowed to ferment for about three to four weeks. This is where the flavors really start to develop. If you tried to eat cocoa beans by themselves, they probably wouldn't, um, wouldn't uh, make you very excited. But once they've been fermented, that's where a lot of the flavor starts to really come in. Then they're roasted. And the roasting process also takes place in the jungle. So a great deal of this all happens in the tropics. It happens in third world nations and remote parts of the world before the beans ever make it to a chocolate factory. A lot of the big chocolate factories that we know of today are in Europe, but there are a few in the United States. Um, there's also uh, a chocolate industry in Japan, Singapore, um, but you'll see that uh, the beans do not come from those places. Forestero beans, they're about 90% of most all cocoa beans are Forestero. They're basic beans, basic bulk beans. They have a strong bitter taste, they're dark in color, What's really popular about them is that they're easy to grow and they can handle a lot of uh, varied temperatures and climate. So that makes them easy to grow. They make also a really good blending bean. Then there's Criollo. Now Criollo, um, these, are, these are the top of the crop. These are less than 2% of the crop. They're very expensive. They're considered fine flavor or noble beans. So if you took Criollo and you blended them with some Forestero beans, you could take what is a basic, a very basic chocolate taste and add some, a lot more complexity with the Criollo beans. There are chocolates that are made from Criollo only and they're very expensive. Um, they're difficult to grow and they're, they're a, lot more, a lot more rare. And then there's Trinitario. It's kind of a blend, kind of a crossbreed between the Forestero and Criollo. These are considered to be fairly expensive beans as well, and they're highly prized, as I say, for adding subtle, subtle uh, complexity to uh, high-quality chocolates. So cocoa beans are basically very similar in many ways um, to nuts and seeds, and you'll see on this chart 
in the fat category, the dietary fiber, the sugar and the starch, the protein, the ash, and the water, or ash is, is minerals, um, cocoa nibs are pretty similar in many ways to almonds and sunflower seed kernels and other, and other nuts like, uh, like walnuts and so forth. You'll notice that the nuts have more protein in them, but other than the protein, they're pretty much very similar to nuts in their nutritional, nutritional uh, value. So the basic cocoa beans are about 50 to 55 percent cocoa butter. Then there are cocoa solids, non-fat. Basically these are everything else that is solid in the cocoa bean, which is proteins, carbohydrates, starches, dietary fiber, uh, small amounts of acid, color and flavor, vitamins and minerals. There's also a little bit of caffeine and theobromine. These are stimulants that are in the chocolate. But basically, um, about half to a little bit more than half is fat. It's basically cocoa butter. So what we do when we make chocolate is we oftentimes then extract that cocoa butter out and we separate it from the fats or non-fat solids. And when we do that, then we can control how the chocolate is put back together in the factory. Now from all of this, we can create different products. So cocoa products that are unsweetened are like cocoa nibs. They're often used as a garnish or as a texture element. There's chocolate liqueur, which essentially is not, it's not an alcoholic beverage. This is basically the mashed up, completely mashed up beans, um, the solids and the cocoa butter, and it's unprocessed. And it's used in some cases by, especially, uh, especially factories that are using chocolate and they want the, they want the raw ingredient. There's also cocoa powder. We use that quite a bit and cocoa butter. Um, now cocoa butter is used both in the chocolate industry but it's also used in the cosmetics industry. Um, so you'll find cocoa butter being used in a lot of different applications but it's very expensive. Chocolate products generally, when we call them chocolate products, they're generally sweetened. So the minute you say call it chocolate, uh, they're generally sweetened products. So this includes bittersweet chocolate and couvertures. Um, if you're not familiar with what a couverture is, we'll be getting to that in a little bit. But basically, a couverture is a very high quality chocolate. There's also milk chocolate and couvertures, and white chocolate and couvertures. So, all three, white, milk, and dark, all come in a form that is referred to as a couverture. And a couverture essentially has certain requirements, and each country has specific uh, regulations about what you can call a couverture. If it doesn't meet the standards of a couverture, then it has to be just called dark chocolate, for example. It can't be called couverture unless it really meets those standards. So they're very high, it's a very high bar to pass. There's also another product called confectionery coating, which is not really chocolate. It's made with some cocoa, uh, like cocoa powder, but it has vegetable fats like palm oil, palm kernel oil, and so forth to approximate what chocolate is like. It's sort of like the margarine of chocolate. But the good thing is, is that because it is made with other types of fats, it doesn't have cocoa butter in it. And that means that it doesn't require tempering, which is really a very, a very attractive thing when you're in a hurry or when you want to keep the cost low. So chocolate and cocoa products are defined by law. So every country has their own idea of what uh, these things have to ha have to contain to be honest with the customer, but they are generally very similar. Uh, most of the laws are very similar between the EU and the EU countries, and then the United States and Canada, and most other countries around the world. The chocolate industry consists of big giant operations like Hershey's, for example, big giant mega million dollar corporation, or even a lot of small operations run by small skilled craftsmen, small businesses that uh, prepare and make chocolate. So cocoa nibs, you'll see them here in the small pile. They are basically just cocoa beans that have been broken up into little pieces. They're like chopped nuts. They uh, basically have a, cocoa, a cacao flavor, uh, but they're unsweetened, so they have a fairly strong bitter taste. Uh, but they are very popular for making things like a cacao uh, brittle, uh, they're used as a garnish and so forth for texture. What we refer to as chocolate liqueur or unsweetened chocolate is made by finely grinding the roasted nibs and it basically is very similar to peanut butter. Um, that's what we refer to as chocolate liqueur. It has 
um, everything in it. So it's got the cocoa butter, it's got the cocoa solids, uh, but there's no sugar added. So some people refer to this in the industry as cocoa, cacao mass, um, bitter chocolate, and baking chocolate. If you ever bought baker's chocolate um, in bars in the supermarket, that's essentially what you have is hardened, tempered um, chocolate liqueur. Chocolate liqueur in unsweetened chocolate is sold in solid blocks in 10 pound blocks or individual drops called coins or chips or uh, thieves, they call them. They call them all kinds of different things. Uh, but basically individual drops like chips are a lot easier to work with since they are in smaller pieces. They're used in batters and doughs of chocolate baked goods. They can be difficult to use, but um, if you melt them and temper them and use them for other things, you can make a lot of good products out of chocolate liqueur. Uh, they're oftentimes melted and then put into things that already have sugar in them. So um, they're, one good example is in our bakery basics class. We use chocolate liqueur, or basically baker's chocolate, along with sugar to make our French silk pie. Now, cocoa powder is also just called cocoa, no sugar added. It's made by squeezing the chocolate liqueur in a, in a large press until everything squeezes out. All of the, all of the uh, cocoa butter squeezes out. They try to get it all out, but a lot of times there's just a little bit left. So some, some uh, cocoa powders have a rated amount of fat in them. And um, basically, uh, you get... Uh, a little bit of change when you start squeezing it all out, squeezing out all the cocoa butter, but uh, it's used heavily in a lot of things for chocolate flavor. We use it to make chocolate cake, for example. We usually add some cocoa powder and we replace some of the flour with it. So it's a natural um, product, but you can, you can buy it natural and you can buy it Dutch process. Now Dutch processed cocoa has been altered in a way. What they've done is they've taken natural cocoa and they uh, add an alkali to it. An alkali, we think of alkalis and we think of things like baking soda. But basically they use a natural alkali to reduce the acid so it cancels out some of the acid and makes the flavor of the cocoa more consistent year-round and from batch to batch. Dutch processed cocoa is very popular and it's highly prized. Um, most a lot, most of the cocoa we have here in America is Dutch processed cocoa. Um, but the reason why they, people like it is one, it has less bite, so it has less acid, but it also, American consumers, um, you know, typically have grown, have grown used to the idea of uh, having a milder flavor. Now, mentions here, North American consumers typically use natural cocoa, but Natural cocoa varies from season to season. So if you open a package of natural cocoa, you're going to find that one package you open will be a light brown, another package will be a dark brown. It varies because of when it was harvested and the season, the season it was harvested in, the soil it was grown in, and so forth. Dutch processed cocoa is much more uh, consistent. You'll see the most common cocoa here is called 10-12 cocoa or 10 to 12 percent cocoa butter with the remaining 88 to 90 percent cocoa solids non-fat. So it basically is a very low fat version of cocoa powder. The stuff that we usually buy um, at the school is usually 22 to 24 percent cocoa, oftentimes referred to as a breakfast cocoa, and it has a higher fat content. Because it has a little higher fat content, um, on, one, on one side it's a little cheaper because it's easier to squeeze out you know, 78% uh, of the fat than it is to squeeze out 88 or 90% of the fat. Um, so it's a little cheaper that way, but because it does have contain more cocoa, but powder, cocoa butter, it's a little more expensive. So it all balances out. By law, American cocoa must have at least 10% cocoa butter. And the European Union requires at least 22%. So generally, uh, you know, this, is, this is where we start seeing the big differences between the EU and the United States. Here's the basic breakdown of everything that's in chocolate. You can see protein 20%, dietary fiber 33%, starches and dextrins and sugars about 22%, and this is without sugar added. You'll also see the word theobromine 2%. 
and theobromine is a stimulant. It's very similar to caffeine, but it adds a little different. It's a little different, a uh, little different type of stimulant than caffeine. So it's uh, basically it's it's got a lot of the sim a similar similar uh, component, similar composition, as I say, to nuts and seeds. So natural cocoa was not treated with an alkali. It's unsweetened chocolate. It's acidic. It has a pH between five and six, which means it's not really heavily acid like a lemon, but it does have a sharper flavor and a lighter color than Dutch cocoa. Dutch cocoa is processed with an alkali, which means that it is seven to nine on the pH scale, which means it's either neutral or even a little bit less, a little bit alkaline, a little bit less acidic, even less acidic than neutral. Um, it can be highly or heavily dutched. Generally, it becomes really dark and really reddish. Um, this is oftentimes where uh, we see some of the earliest, earliest versions of the um, of the red velvet cake it came from uh, treating cocoa powder this way. It would get very red, and it turned into something like a brick color, a brick red. And um, today, uh, that kind of cake, the uh, Red velvet is oftentimes just uh, chocolate cake that has a lot of red food coloring in it. But in the early days, that's how that's how it kind of began. It's with uh, cocoa being um, being treated with an alkali. So, if you wanted to switch between cocoa and chocolate, um, you can say, okay, well, one pound of unsweetened chocolate is equal to about ten ounces of cocoa and six ounces of shortening. The idea there is that you're replacing the cocoa butter with, with another type of fat. Um, you can do that as a substitute. If you didn't have baker's chocolate, you could use cocoa powder and shortening mixed together into a paste, and that would form something that approximates uh, the same components, the same composition as baker's chocolate. Cocoa butter is sold as pale yellow flakes. Um, it is sold to cosmetic and confectionery industries. It's very popular in the bake shop because what we use it for is thinning out thicker chocolates. So when we want a chocolate to have more fluidity so that we can use it for coating things and for dipping, um, it's great to add a little bit of extra cocoa butter. It's also brushed into pastry shells. Um, it, you, it works great as a, as a waterproof barrier inside cream-based cream pies like a banana cream pie because it will help keep you crisp your crust crisp. Um, cocoa butter is highly saturated and uh, it's, it resists going rancid. It holds up for about two years without at room temperature. But it's very different than other types of fat. Straight cocoa butter is really different than the other fats we've talked about when we talked about fats and oils. Um, it, it has a, uh, it had, like I mentioned, I think I mentioned earlier, it has six different types of fat crystals in it. So we'll get to talking about those in a little in a few minutes. It's unique in that it has a pleasant mouthfeel because it melts quickly at body temperature. And you can see in this chart the amount of solids at the solid fat at different temperatures. By the time cocoa butter in the light brown line reaches 95 degrees Fahrenheit, there is no solids left. Now, I don't know about you, but your body and my body are generally more than 95 degrees Fahrenheit, which means that when you put cocoa butter or something with cocoa butter in it in your mouth, it will become fully liquid just from your body heat. Compare that to all-purpose shortening, which is still quite solid, has quite a bit of solids left in it at 95 degrees, and feels quite waxy and quite gummy in the mouth. Really not a very good feeling. Um, so cocoa butter is and chocolate in general is very popular partly because of the mouthfeel. It really creates a very pleasant melting quality. Now, what we have in chocolate, like I mentioned, chocolate liqueur, sugar, and then there's optional ingredients. Um, you can add dairy to it. Usually the dairy that's added is not liquid dairy, but it's usually, um, it's usually uh, milk powder that's added to the cocoa and then added to the cocoa butter to make milk chocolate. Um, you can also add just dairy and no cocoa solids and you can get white chocolate. Butter is oftentimes added um, to two things, but uh, if you want a softer result that doesn't get quite as firm and quite as hard, butter can make uh, a finished chocolate a little bit softer. 
vanillin in other flavorings. Now, vanillin is an artificial vanilla flavor. It comes from oak trees, from the bark of the oak tree. You can also use real vanilla, but there's also a lot of other flavorings that can be added to chocolate. Um, lecithin, a small amount, a very, very trace amount of soy lecithin is oftentimes added to make sure that the cocoa butter stays stable. Uh, you'll see chocolate bars with nuts in them. Um, nuts are used quite a bit. It's very traditional additive. And then additional cocoa butter. Uh, additional cocoa butter is used to help, uh, as they make the chocolate more fluid. And it helps to make it melt nicer too. So what you end up with is something that feels even better in the mouth. Now let's get back to chocolate products. U.S. standards for chocolate. You'll see if we call it bittersweet, or semi-sweet. Now remember, the words are used pretty interchangeably here, but bittersweet and semi-sweet are basically the same thing. In America, we have to have at least 35% chocolate liqueur, and dairy solids cannot be more than 12%. So, what does that mean? Well, that's just, that's just the regulations from the U.S. government. If it's milk chocolate, it has to have a minimum of 10% chocolate liqueur, and it has to have at least 12% milk. So if you're going to call it milk chocolate, there has to be milk in it. And with white chocolate, you don't have to have any chocolate liqueur. All you have to have is cocoa butter and 14% minimum milk. In order for white chocolate to be called that, you would have to have at least 20% minimum cocoa butter. You have to have some milk fat, 3.5%, 5% maximum whey, and 55% maximum sugar. 55% maximum sugar. So there's pretty, pretty strict regulations. You'll see that in Canada, it's a little simpler, but um, they're bittersweet or semi-sweet chocolate, same, pretty much the same as the United States, except that we, they, they require even less milk to be in it, 5% maximum. And cocoa butter minimum, they, they add the cocoa butter minimum, so they say it has to have at least 18% cocoa butter just to be called bittersweet or dark or semi-sweet chocolate. And then cocoa solids have to be at least 14%. Now, we haven't gotten to couverture yet. These aren't couvertures. Um, we're just talking about chocolate products. So when we make chocolate products, we're refining them by grinding and finely and grinding them finely and by conching. Conching involves the gentle heating, mixing, and kneading of the cocoa liqueur. It helps to make it smoother. It makes the particles smaller. Then uh, it is tempered, carefully melted, and cooled in order to encourage the crystallization of the cocoa butter so that it crystallizes in a very specific way. What that does is it gives you really good appearance. You get great shine, you get great melting quality, it'll melt correctly in the mouth, and when it's, when it's allowed to harden, it will harden fully at room temperature. Now, we use these chocolate products typically for creams, mousses, ganaches, and so forth because they're not as expensive. Um, we don't have to go as far with it when we make regular old chocolate products. We can call it chocolate, but if it's going to be called a couverture, we have to go much further and it's much more expensive. A good example of a basic chocolate product is Hershey's chocolate. It's a good chocolate, it's a reasonable chocolate, and it's reasonably priced. So refining is of no benefit to baked goods, it just adds cost. So there's no use, to, no use in wasting good, really super high quality chocolate on something that's going to be baked. May as well use something less expensive. No one will notice the difference. It's not directly interchangeable pound for pound with unsweetened chocolate because it does have sugar in it. So what we have to do is if we are, have a recipe that calls for unsweetened chocolate and we're going to use a chocolate product that means it has sugar in it, we have to back off on sugar somewhere else in the recipe because the chocolate products have sugar in them. So they're often labeled with a percent cacao uh, solids or the cocoa solids. Um, but there are a lot that are not. And the reason why is because they don't have to by law. Um, they don't have to list, Hershey's doesn't have to list how much it has in the way of total cacao content in their chocolate. They do it on a few of their products, but it's not required. It is required by law in European Union, and it represents the combining of the total ingredients in the from the cocoa bean. So that means that if you say that a chocolate has 60% cacao content, that includes the cocoa liqueur, the ground cocoa nib, 
cocoa powder, and cocoa butter. So anything from the tree, originally from the tree, is what is included in that percentage. Here's a good example. This chocolate's from San Francisco. It's called Guitard. It's 38% cacao content. That means that 38% of what's in there, whether it be the cocoa solids, whether it be the cocoa butter, come from the, coca from the cacao tree. The rest is sugar, dairy, and other ingredients. So um, you can generally have a curvature quality milk chocolate these days, but traditionally you would have much higher, even higher standards for curvature than what we see here. This is a very high quality milk chocolate. Bittersweet chocolate, as I mentioned earlier, bittersweet or semi-sweet um, is used interchangeably. Generally people in Europe call it dark chocolate and if used in the place of unsweetened chocolate just make adjustments for sugar. Um, when it's used as a pound for pound direct replacement for unsweetened chocolate, dark chocolate with its high sugar content produces different results. So you can see these brownies are really different because one has sugar, extra sugar in the recipe. So milk chocolate contains dairy solids. Um, it also contains more sugar. And overall compared to dark chocolates, lower in cocoa solids, higher in sugar. Um, generally when you make mousses, creams, and ganache out of milk chocolate you'll get a softer set because it doesn't have as much cocoa butter in it and it's not going to set as, as firmly. It often requires the use of formulas separate from those for dark chocolate because dark chocolate has so much more cocoa butter and cocoa solids in it than milk chocolate does. White chocolate has no cocoa solids at all um, except for cocoa butter. So it's essentially um, milk chocolate without the cocoa solids. It has no chocolate flavor. Uh, the chocolate, the flavor is predominantly vanilla and it generally is just cocoa butter, sugar, and milk, milk solids. So it's uh, a very gentle flavor and uh, some people really like it, some people really don't, but most, most people in the chocolate world consider white chocolate to not be chocolate. It's not really chocolate if it doesn't have the cocoa solids in it. So let's get to that word couverture. What is couverture? Couverture in French just means coating. Um, this is chocolate they use for coating things. It has a high cocoa butter content. It has to have, has to have by law, a minimum of 31% cocoa, cocoa butter. That's a lot of cocoa butter. And some couvertures have as much as 40 to 45% cocoa butter. Chocolate, dark chocolate, milk chocolate couvertures are available. Um, although I remember 20, 25 years ago, no one would ever consider a milk chocolate to be a couverture. It was only dark chocolate. But now, nowadays the industry has started to change and they're starting to accept milk chocolates and even some white chocolates that have the minimum amount of cocoa butter in them to be labeled as couverture. They're mainly used for dipping and coating um, and the reason why is because these are things that are going to be standing out um, in front of the customer. They're going to be something people can actually see. So because of that, it has to look good and cocoa butter, uh, high cocoa butter content, make sure that you're going to have a nice thin coating of chocolate. It's also going to shrink properly. When you have a high amount of cocoa butter and it is tempered, when it hardens, it shrinks. That allows it to release from molds. It provides good sheen or good shine. It provides real good firmness because the cocoa butter is such a high amount, it will provide really good firmness and a good snap when it's, when it's bent. It won't bend like, like, a, like a dead carrot. It's going to bend with a snap. It's going to have good snap. And it's going to provide really good melt-away mouthfeel. That's what makes the difference. Now, of course, all these qualities add to the cost. Typically, couvertures run a minimum of $5 a pound, and they go upwards to $500 a pound. It really depends on where it comes from, how finely it's produced, what type, how rare are the beans. There are some chocolates that are very, very expensive. I've, I've, per, I've, I've had chocolates recently that are usually $9 to oh, $18 a pound or so, and those are rather uh, amazing chocolates just in that price range. So there's really no need to start looking at the highest, highest end of chocolate. Um, you can buy very, very good couverture for uh, between $9 and $12 a pound. So 
The added cocoa butter in couvertures makes them ideal for one of their main uses, which is dipping and coating. It also makes it great for molding chocolates. It great, makes it great for an outer coating on anything. Uh, but it is expensive. Then there's confectionery coating. We talked about this earlier. It's called glaze. A lot of times we'll refer to it just as glaze, but some people refer to it as summer chocolate. They refer to it as pâté glacé, non-tempering chocolate, or compound coating. There's a lot of different, what people use different terms for it. But using the name chocolate coating is not legally correct because it isn't really chocolate. It's not. So that's why we refer to it as glaze. It, instead of containing cocoa butter, it contains processed vegetable fats such as partially hydrogenated soybean oil, palm kernel oil, coconut oil, and these harden at room temperature without having to be tempered. That makes the big difference. So, like I say, it is what it is to couverture what margarine is to butter. It's less expensive, super easy to use. It's really great when you have employees who are uh, less experienced with chocolate and don't know how to temper. You can get them to make beautiful products and uh, it works great for, for, uh, the inex for inexperienced hands. So when we, uh, when we work with chocolate, we melt the chocolate before use. All chocolate comes to us already tempered. We can use the microwave, we could use a double boiler, uh, but you want to melt it carefully, you don't want to overheat it. Um, that's one thing about chocolate. It melts at 91 degrees Fahrenheit and it will become completely fully melted by 113 degrees Fahrenheit. That's not very hot. There's no need to get it hotter than that. All you need to do with chocolate when you melt it is melt it just to melting. That's it. If you go further, you run the risk that it can become thick, lumpy, and dull. It can end up separating. The cocoa butter can separate out of it and that can make it, it can ruin it. Um, now, if you do ruin some chocolate, you could throw it away, but generally most chocolate, even chocolate that's been overheated, can still make a reasonably good ganache. So don't throw it away because generally it's, it's too expensive to throw away. It's better, you can just use it to make, make some ganache. Um, water and steam also uh, can ruin chocolate. If you get it into chocolate, it will cause the chocolate to seize up and turn into something that's very similar to clay. Um, again, it's not ruined. It's ruined for use as a coating, but it can be used to make ganache. So I still, I don't throw it away. I'll use it and make ganache out of it. Tempering we've done in the international pastries class. And um, I think it's important to note that we've, we've done it the old fashioned way. Okay, we've done it with a bowl and seeding or tabling the chocolate. Um, this machine you see in the picture is called the Hilliard's Little Dipper. It's basically a tempering machine. Um, you still have to know how to temper in order to use it, but basically it will maintain the temperature of your chocolate. So you bring it up to melting, get it up to 113, you add seed to it, turn on the machine, it will agitate it for you, and then after a certain amount of time you run a test. If it's in temper, you set, that, you set the dial for to hold, and it will remain in temper all day long. It's a wonderful machine. It really saves you a lot of time. Um, it is about $2,000 for a machine like that. So you have to make, you have to be making a lot of chocolate to make it worth your while. But um, when we melt chocolate, the idea here is we're trying to control for time, temperature, and agitation. These are the three main elements when it comes to chocolate. If we don't give chocolate what it needs, you'll get a dull appearance, an unappealing texture, poor flavor, it won't have the right texture, it won't snap, and you could get fat bloom, which means that gray-white streaks will start to develop over time on the surface of your chocolate. Several methods are available for tempering chocolate. We've tried a few of them. We've tried, we've tried seeding, we've tried tabling, which essentially is seeding by cooling the chocolate on a surface. Um, but the idea there is to get, uh, when we cool it down rapidly, the idea there is that we're trying to get the stable crystals of fat to form in the cocoa butter, and these are called form five crystals. Let's take a look at an illustration of it. Um, cocoa butter is a polymorphic fat, which means it has a lot of different, several different types of fat in it. Um, it has six main types, um, or six. There's six main types. We use five primarily, but you will see in the illustrations here that the three main crystals, uh, crystal types, and their names are listed below. Um, but basically you can form them into uh, 
uh, you can group them into two basic groups, alpha crystals and beta crystals. We want beta crystals and we want form 5 beta crystals. In order to get those, form 5 crystals, you'll see by, uh, they're in the purple here, they're listed as having a melting point, MP melting point, of 92.8 degrees Fahrenheit. If you drop the temperature of chocolate rapidly, the first crystals that are going to form are form 5. So if you do it rapidly enough, you'll get enough form 5 formed in order to get them to dominate your chocolate. Now, we can see in the upper illustration here what melted chocolate looks like. We just say these little lines represent melted chocolate. Um, so it's formless. It has no crystals in it. So moving over here, we'll see when chocolate cools on its own, if you don't temper it, then you will get a mixture of different types of crystals. All the crystals will be there, and the crystals don't pack in hard, nice and hard and dense as they would if they were form 5 beta crystals. So this, the chocolate will be soft, dull, it won't snap when it's broken, and it won't shrink, which means it won't be able to be removed from molds. So it'll get stuck in your molds. The crystals are unstable. Uh, they melt when you touch them, and they generally are, are just really annoying to work with when chocolate is just allowed to cool on its own. It also takes a long time to cool on its own and to finally get uh, firm enough to handle. Um, but that's why we temper. If we can get the, the form 5 beta crystals to form, they will not melt as easily uh, in the hands, for example. They will be more stable. They will harden within 3-5 to five minutes at room temperature and will get a great result. So let's say we melted our chocolate to 113 degrees Fahrenheit. Okay, we're going to cool this chocolate. So at this point, you mold up your chocolate. As it cools, the cocoa butter begins to follow the pattern of the type 5 seed crystals that we've left in it. Now, we put seed in it to teach the rest of the melted chocolate what type of crystal should be dominant. And we can see the purple crystals here on the left are representing the seeds that we've put in. As the seeds start to grow, and as, the, as, the, as that chocolate starts to melt into the melted chocolate, it will start creating a chain reaction. And other crystal, other uh, beta, form 5 beta crystals will start to form. Then they will find other beta crystals, and they'll start grouping together. Um, the crystal formation continues, causing the chocolate to thicken and set up more and more as more of the melted chocolate forms cocoa butter, um, of the cocoa butter forms around the type 5 crystals. Then it grows even more. As you can see, the chain reaction is starting to happen. And once you generally get down to, um, you start getting down into the, into the middle 80s, around 88 down to 84 degrees, we're seeing a lot more of these crystals starting to aggregate and form. And they are dominating all the chocolate. They're dominating all the other types of crystals that, could, that may want to form. But these are grouping together so quickly that the others don't have time to do it. So finally, the chocolate fully sets up, and we end up with a hard um, crystal, or type 5 cocoa butter, of tempered chocolate. Because they fit together so nicely, you get really good shine. You get really good snap because they're fitting together so tightly that when you bend it, they break instead of bending. Um, and because they, are just, they melt just below body temperature, you get a great uh, melt, melting feel. Um, but also because they fit so tightly together, that's what helps cause them to shrink as well and helps them release from molds. So here is the crystallization curve. Um, if we melt chocolate um, until all the crystals dissolve, let's say we take it up to, for dark chocolate, let's say I say like 113, but they're saying 118 here. Then you drop that temperature rapidly down to 81 degrees Fahrenheit. When you do that, that's what's going to, cause the, um, the type 5 beta crystals to start forming rapidly. You're agitating while you're cooling. Remember, we need time, temperature, and agitation. So we're going to give it time, the time to crystallize, but we're also going to agitate it, and we're, gonna, um, we're also going to change its temperature rapidly. Then after it reaches, gets down to about 80, I'd say 81 to 84 degrees, you're going to see a noticeable thickening of the chocolate. And what that, what that is, is your type, four, type 5 beta crystals forming quickly. Um, so then, once you get down to that point, you can then bring your temperature back up. And they're showing here for dark chocolate, 89 degrees. Uh, 89 degrees is a good working temperature. It's fluid, 
but the crystals, the four or five crystals, have not reached their melting point yet, so they're still dominating at that temperature. If you're working with chocolate and you over, overheat it after working with it, and you had it tempered, but now you've overheated it and you get it above 91.4 degrees, it will start melting the type 5 beta crystals and you'll have to retemper and start over. So, just to go back here a little bit on cocoa then, what's providing, what, what does cocoa do? It provides color, so from light tan to a black color, provides distinct flavor. Um, that's obviously a really good thing, but it does contain acid as well, so cocoa powder, for example, and or chocolate um, will react with baking soda, so it because it has enough acid in it, it can help, help with leavening. Um, there, it's a really, really popular for that, that quality. When you make a chocolate cake, you oftentimes use baking soda instead of baking powder because of the natural acids that occur in, in, in the chocolate or cocoa. So they absorb liquids. When you have cocoa solids, uh, or cocoa powder in this case, it is a drying agent, so it will cause um, a product, it will absorb liquid. And because of proteins and carbohydrates that are in it, it will absorb quite a bit um, more liquid than most flours. It provides structure in that it has starch in it, and um, that, that structure of, of starch that's in the, and, and the protein that's in the cocoa solids will help provide structure. Um, the cocoa butter has about half the tenderizing power, power of shortening, but um, it hardens quite well when it's brought back to room temperature, so it can also help with structure. It provides a pleasing mouthfeel because even when it's mixed into things, it melts in the mouth. When there's cocoa butter around, it melts in the mouth very nicely. It has nutritional value. Um, cocoa beans are a real food. The only thing about it is we have to store it carefully because, one, it's expensive. So well-wrapped and stored in covered containers, keep away, keep away from any sort of pests, rodents, insects, uh, prevent moisture pickup. Um, remember that uh, you know there's sugar in it, so it can grab onto moisture in the atmosphere and can cause sugar bloom, where sugar crystals start forming on the outside of the chocolate. Once you get, to sh once you get sugar bloom, the chocolate's ruined, you have to, to just chop it up and use it for ganache. Um, keep it away from strong odors. It can easily, easily absorb those odors. And uh, to prevent fat bloom, keep the temperature real stable. It should be cool, dry environment. White and milk chocolates have the shortest shelf life, and that's partly because of the, all, of, all of the dairy that's in them. It can actually undergo Maillard browning at room temperature. Milk, choc milk fats undergo oxidative rancidity, which means it goes rancid. And typically, if you buy milk or white chocolate, don't buy more than you would use up in six months to a year. Uh, just use, buy what you need now, use it up, and buy fresh. It will go, if, if you buy too much of it, it'll sit around on the shelf, and before you know it, it will start to go bad, and you'll, be, you'll waste all that money. It's, and the dark chocolate has a much longer shelf life. Dark chocolate holds up for about two years at room temperature with no refrigeration. Sugar bloom, as I mentioned, is where chocolate picks up moisture. This is why we never put chocolate in the refrigerator. We don't store it in the refrigerator because it'll pick up the humidity and then it'll form crystals of, of sugar on the outside, creating a grittiness that you cannot get rid of unless you melt it completely and add liquid, which means add it, making ganache out of it. Um, so when you pull chocolate out of a cool environment, keep it wrapped until it comes to room temperature because it will start to sweat. Just like in you know here in the summertime in, in, in Iowa, we have enough humidity where anything pulled out of a cool environment will start to sweat. Cocoa powder, it's hygroscopic like sugar, so during storage it can clump and develop off flavors and eventually even mold. So again, buy what you're going to use in, in the near future, but don't buy more than you need or, or don't have to do, so you don't have to store it for a long period of time. If it is properly stored, it can last for a long, long time, but um, you run the risk of having it go bad, something happening to it, and you can end up throwing it away. All right, so what are we going to do in the lab today? We're going to be going in the lab. We're reviewing how to temper chocolate. Uh, I want you to temper eight ounces of chocolate. 
and I want to make sure that each of you has a good test to confirm that it's tempered. You'll be preparing um, two batches of chocolate ganache with it. Actually, you're going to be produ producing one batch of chocolate ganache with it. Uh, we're going to prepare cream ganache using eight ounces of tempered chocolate and four ounces of room temperature cream. The key here is that the chocolate is tempered and the, room, the, the cream is room temperature. It's not boiling. Here we're going to be creating crystallized tempered ganache. Uh, combine the chocolate and the cream, allow it to rest until the temperature falls down to 75 degrees Fahrenheit. We want to let it cool on down. What that's going to do is, remember our time, temperature, and agitation, we're not going to agitate it yet. We're going to give it time to rest and we're also going to let the temperature come down to 75. Then when it reaches that, we're going to stir gently to agitate and that will start the crystallization process. Once that happens, we're going to, we're going to, our ganache will be ready to use. And we'll be able to pipe it. We're going to pipe it into bite-sized pearls, about three-quarters of an inch in diameter on parchment paper, and allow it to crystallize overnight. Uh, we'll, we'll work with it tomorrow in the lab, um, and we're going to make uh, do some practice on hand-rolling of, uh, of chocolate truffles. So uh, label and cover yours with plastic, label and store your ganache on the speed rack for tomorrow's lab, and we'll get... Uh, some additional additional practice working with the ganache, but also working with tempered chocolate. So we're going to be tempering today, and we're going to be tempering tomorrow. I just want to make sure that all of you have a good refresher in the skill of tempering ganache, tempering chocolate. All right, well, bring your uniform, wear your mask. I'll see you uh, in the lab. See you tomorrow.